today's lecture is we're changing the format a little bit because nice to have the pictures here automatically, especially a topic like this. We're talking about cataract tools or steps of cataract surgery. And because we're talking about cataract surgery and more of the specifics, we're also going to talk about technology. And this is a little bit more in depth than what we spoke on the last cataract lecture. So you'll learn a bit about the tools that we use in surgery. And just as a summary, remember blurry vision, you're gonna have hazy, blurry vision, glare, halos, and this is our cataract patient. <laughs> um, here's some examples. It's not always this dense. And these are some pretty big mature cataracts, but Regardless of the size of cataract or the type of cataract, we always can do the surgery to remove it. And the staging, the types of cataract sets in the last lecture. So today we're talking more about the actual surgery. And when patients are brought into the surgery room, already Laura's there getting things set up. So I think, that, oh good, it does play. So there she is, she's putting her gloves on. She then um, gets all the tools ready for surgery, so I hope you guys saw that. The patient's on the table, we roll the patient right up to the microscope, and then the nurse is gonna put a couple of anesthetic eye drops in the eye. And usually we'll use like a proparacane or a tetracaine, some type of anesthetic. And interestingly enough, that's just enough to make it through the whole surgery, just a couple of eye drops, topically. So that is, that's Brittany. She's our, one of the nurses in the operating room. She gives those eye drops to the patient. So good. Some of the video did show up in here. That's good. So she put some of those eye drops there. You can see Laura doing those last minute preps, double checking everything as we're getting ready to start the surgery. So I don't actually have a picture of Brittany prepping someone's eye because patient confidentiality, but this is a stock image of what happens. So you can see we have the betadine and it's on four by fours and the nurse is with sterile gloves going to prep. Usually we'll prep the upper part of the face. That includes the, the eyebrows, the cheek, all the way around the nose, not just the eye, but everything around it. So that's all prepped with betadine. Next, you can see here what's going on. This is not our patient, but a stock image. We take some drapes. So the blue drapes are, <laughs> there's the okay. so We put the blue drapes around the patient. So that keeps everything sterile. It keeps the oxygen nasal cannula out of the way and it ensures that the surgical space is sterile. And some drapes like this one don't have an opening, so we use scissors to open up the center plastic. And then we have to put a speculum in the eye that keeps the eyelashes out of the way. And people say, oh, how, do you, how do you do the surgery? Do you take my eye out? What if I blink? We don't do any of that. We just use a little tool like this. It looks like a little paper clip and it holds the eye open. So all the patient really has to do now is kind of hold steady, look straight ahead at a microscope light. And I think we've now accumulated enough pictures. We have several patients who are artistically inclined or who actually are artists, and they have drawn pictures of what they see during surgery. So at some point, I'm gonna put those and put those online too so you can see some of those but anyway step one is here this is a really tiny side port it's about one millimeter and we are creating a tiny tiny paracentesis that's called a tiny tunnel at the side of the eye so it goes through the cornea into the eye and it's about one millimeter so not very much at all smaller than the tip of a pencil. Then through that tiny little paracentesis, we will sometimes put 
a few other medications, maybe some more lidocaine or numbing agents. And more important is this. This is a gooey substance, almost like a gel. And that's the viscoelastic. That holds the whole anterior chamber of the eye open and stable while we do the surgery. So there's a lot of different types of viscoelastics. I think that's maybe a lot of detail we don't need to go over. But viscoelastic, that's what you use. That holds the eye, the cornea, it holds the capsule, everything out of the way to do the operation. So now we've created some steps to stabilize the eye. Now we're going to make our tunnel and at least when we're doing the conventional methods, not the laser method, when we do the conventional methods, we're making a tunnel either like in this case, this is a diamond. So that keratome is made out of diamonds. You can also use one made out of a very sharp polished steel, but that creates anywhere from a two to three millimeter tunnel at the edge of the cornea. So remember, we've already made a paracentesis um, if the surgeon is right-handed, they'll usually do the paracentesis somewhere over here on the left side. If the surgeon is left-handed, they'll usually put the paracentesis somewhere over here. Because the dominant hand is going to be here, the non-dominant hand is going to be off to the side. So now you have two ports of entry. Now that we've created that tunnel, we can now fit these forceps into the eye to create the capsularexis. And notice we're gently opening up the capsule. That's the very front of the lens. We're opening that capsule and we try to do it in a curved and linear fashion. So it creates a round opening. If you go back historically, um, back to the early 80s, um, they would just use a, a little needle and then slice this open. That's called a can opener. But then, pretty early on, uh, Dr. Gimbel, who was my mentor, he devised this nice technique where we create a round rexus. So now it's much more stable. The round opening is less likely to tear or radialize. So how does this work? I think understanding the, the anatomy of the lens is important. You're going to have your zonules that hold the whole lens in place. The entire cataract is contained by this capsular bag. That's this line here. So to remove the cataract, we have to open that capsule. We're going to literally peel that top part of the capsule away. And now we have access to the contents of that capsular bag. Questions so far on that? Does that make sense? We've now entered the eye through the cornea, we've now peeled away that enter capsule, and now we have access to the cataract inside. So this is a really nice capsulotomy. It's nice and round, and now we're going to take a cannula, and we are going to place saline solution in between the capsule and the cataract. And what this does is it creates a fluid wave or a separation between the contents of the bag and the cataract. So I think, I don't know, that's a good analogy for that. You know when you go to the grocery store and you try to open up that vegetable bag and it's like stuck, so you, you pinch a little bit and then you blow into it and it opens up? Well. We can't really blow air through this, so we are infusing it with some saline to try to separate, to open up that bag a little bit, create some space. So you can see that cannula goes here, it tips right underneath the capsule, and then we infuse it with the saline, which will wrap all around the back side, and will open up the bag, creating a separation between your cataract and the capsule. So I love that step. After we do that, a lot of um, surgeons, myself included, will, tr will, will then grab that lens and we'll make sure it's free. We're going to spin it around inside the bag. So you can see the bag and then your, your cataract we're going to spin, maybe 180 or 360 degrees, we spin. Here's kind of a schematic of that. The 
fluid is going to go around the whole cataract, creating a space, a potential space between the capsule and the cataract. And if you remember, the dense nucleus, that's the core area, and then the cortex is on the outer rim. So now that we've created that separation, we can now start to remove the cataract. And this is one of the more traditional ways. It's, um, you know, maybe the past 20, 25 years, most cataract surgeons do it this way. You will take your fake emulsification, which is the tool that has the ultrasound that breaks up cataract. You're going to create a groove or trench right down the center. And then you're going to take your second tool through that paracentesis side port. And now you're going to take those two parts of the cataract and split it in half. And then we're going to rotate 90 degrees, and you're going to do it again. So now you have four segments, four pieces of the pie. And that's called the divide and conquer technique. That's probably what the majority of cataract surgeons do. So let's go over that again. We're going to create that groove in the center. We're then going to rotate. And then when you do the two grooves, now you're going to have those four quadrants. You can take each of those quadrants out one by one by one. There we go. You can see those little pieces of cataract now. The fecal emulsification probe is going to grab that piece and then apply ultrasound energy to break it up or emulsify it, and then it's then aspirated as tiny particles. So not really the technique I prefer because trouble with the divide and conquer is you have to create a very large trench in the center of the cataract and that that does apply a lot of pressure to the zonules and it, it uses a lot of ultrasound energy and so how do we avoid applying too much energy well two methods one is on the left hand side you're going to see it's called the chop method where instead of grooving and trenching through the center, we use both of our hands to chop up the cataract into wedges. That way there's less ultrasound energy. Or the other method is on the, on the right, you'll see that's using the laser. So let's play those side by side so you can see the comparison. So on the left, you'll see that's my video. We are using our hands to break it up one by one by one. And now that one, it's great. I have six tiny pieces I can now remove sequentially. So it's it's pretty fast process. When you chop it, you don't have to create a slow trance. You can, you can just snap through each of the pieces. Let me play that one more time so you can see that on the left. So using my two hands, I will break each piece up into smaller fragments. And that's how we break it up manually. Each of those pieces then we remove. So let me reverse one more time so you now you can look on the other edge of the screen. So now you're gonna look on the right. So instead of by hand with an ultrasound, we can use the laser. So the laser on this one, you're gonna see it create the capsulotomy. It's perfectly round, perfectly centered. The laser can also create cuts through the cornea for your incisions and tunnels. It's creating these shock waves to break apart the tissue. And then you can use the laser to also break up the cataract into smaller fragments. Then it's very easy to remove. So two different methods when people ask, well, what's the difference? I mean, we're doing the same step, but one is the computer's doing it. One is we're doing it by hand. So now that we've removed the nuclear cataract, and this is whether by laser or by ultrasound, we're left with these tiny little filaments of cortex. These are this fluffy cataract material on the edge. And so you can see in this picture, we're using a different tool. It's not the FACO emulsification tool. It's an irrigation aspiration tool. It's usually covered by silicone, so it's very soft. 
And we're using that to gently polish and remove the cortex. It's one of my favorite steps. This is where patients see a lot of the colors and lights because as we remove cortex, the theory is that you're tugging slightly on the capsule, which tugs on the zonules, which then creates some of these visual effects. Turquoise, golden reds, people see colors. Okay, so now that we've cleared out the capsule with all the contents, we've polished it, now we're gonna fill it up with more viscoelastic. And in a lot of our patients, when we want the extra accuracy, now that everything's out of the way, the cataract is clear, we're gonna do aura. And this is that measurement that we use this high-tech laser. It's attached to the microscope. <coughs> and it's gonna measure the vision. So this gives us real-time measurements of their vision during surgery. And if you haven't seen, we do have a video on that, uh, kind of showing some of the work in surgery. I think I put it up maybe two or three years ago. So there it is. Um, we get both the piece on the microscope and we also have this freestanding um, computer display image that shows us what we're seeing. So in real time, it gives me a heads up display. It tells me, okay, do we need to make it a little adjustment on the power of the lens? Do we have to rotate our toric lens a little bit? And then every few months, it has an update. So based on our outcomes, it's going to update our surgeon factor. So every year that goes by, we're getting more and more refined outcomes because of this learning curve. That's, it's empirically giving us better data as the years go on. So there's the heads up display. So neat to see this. So in real time, we can see the whole, <laughs> the whole eye. You can see as we're doing our measurements, you can see the refraction, you can see the axis of the, of the uh, astigmatism, and it helps us to be right on target with our surgery implant. So now that we've done our measurements, we're going to then make our lens selection. And you can see that in real time happening, kind of neat. Interestingly, as we do this, if their eyes are a little dry or as they move, you'll see the refraction change while we're there. Um, and that's kind of the display that I see. You can see that almost like that red display right on top of it. And it shows me which way to rotate the lens. <laughs> and it shows me what the power of the lens is. So it's, um, it's really neat to have that. Let me show that one more time because it's just kind of neat to see that in, in real time. So. That's gonna be what you see on the computer monitor if you're an assistant in the room. And we're selecting our power there. But if you're me sitting at the microscope, you're gonna see this. You're gonna see that heads up display. It's actually tracking the pupil. It's actually measuring the astigmatism real time. So really need to have that technology. And now that we've been using it for so many years, I always wonder, how we did it before this, you know, seven years ago. Questions on Aura. So I think for anyone that wants a little more precision for surgery or has maybe a history of LASIK, definitely Aura is really good to have. So now that we've selected our lens, Laura's gonna load it into the lens, or if it's the new Clarion, we don't have to load it, it's already loaded. We're gonna implant into the eye. So there you see it. Um, I'll play that maybe one more time for you. Let's see if I can do that here. Ready? It happens quick. So it's already rolled up. This is the in, uh, lens inserter. I think this is a video I had from a few years back. So it slowly is implanted into the eye. And you can see the two haptics begin to open up. And now we can take another tool to gently position it and make sure the arms open where we want and we make sure the lens is rotated in the correct position. So that's the lens implant. Any questions on that so far? Okay. So I think one thing that might help when you're talking to patients about this is having a little idea about the history because up until a few years ago, we didn't have so many lens options. And 
And I think if you go back in time, maybe three, four years even, you only had a, f a handful of options. And all the lenses at that point were either monofocal or bifocal. So that creates some limits. And I think as you talk to patients about this, it's good to know the history because you can see how much better we are today in this current age versus maybe five, 10 years back. So some of the older lenses you might hear people talk about um, are here. Crystal lens, now this one was interesting. It had the center optic. Notice it's a little smaller than the others. So the optic and the center is smaller. But it has this large plate that has a bendable arm to it. So the haptics in this case are flexible. And this is nice. For the people that had this lens, this is several years back, um, the flexible haptic here allowed them to have some mild accommodation. So we are able to give patients distance and they can zoom up to maybe about the computer arm's length. This lens fell out of favor pretty quickly because some of them, two or three years later, the haptics would scar in position. And if they scarred diagonally, now the lens, one arm was bent forward, one arm might be bent backward, and now the lens is tilted. And this would induce astigmatism. So these patients, <laughs> we see them three, four years later, and they were all of a sudden who didn't need glasses right after surgery. Now they're in glasses for everything because they have a diopter of, ast of astigmatism. So this lens, I think, is you're probably going to see very limited surgeons still using it to this day because some of those effects that we would see a few years later. Um, next lens, this came out I think around 2016, around that time frame, and this was almost at the time a game changer because it had m these rings of focus, but it gave more of an extended range. So Symphony was amazing for the people that had it because they were able to see distance and it had a zoom in effect to about arm's length. The trouble we saw with this is many of these patients had no vision up close for reading and many of them had pretty significant nighttime symptoms. The spider webs of, is what people describe where they're looking at night and there's a just this halo of spider webbing. So a lot of negative visual effects, especially at night with the symphony lens. And so I think this one also too, you're gonna see very few surgeons that are still using it. So around that same time, Restore came out and this is a different company. This lens was interesting. It didn't have that extended range, but it had two points of focus, distance and intermediate. But the difference was the center of the lens, the very center ring, had a large optical zone. So the patients that had this lens had, in general, pretty good distance, pretty good night vision, and they had some intermediate. So it kind of was a a little bit of a trade-off. We don't get as much range, but we get better distance, better night vision. You can see with every lens technology, there's a trade-off. <laughs> so you can't have it all. <laughs> you can't have, I can see at night, I can see like an eagle, and I can see up close. You just can't do it all. So everything is a trade-off with every lens. So Nice to have an idea about some of the history. Occasionally you'll run, run across patients who had surgery 10 years ago and they'll tell you about these lenses. And notice interesting, you can kind of look and a lot of times tell by, by the shape of the lens. You can look at them and you can say, oh, I can see you had a crystal lens. And they'll say, how did you know? We can tell only one lens looks like this. <laughs> I mean, it's pretty significant. Um, uh, one more question that'll come up sometimes with the crystal lens patients because a lot of them now that had it, you know, several years back, a lot of them are wearing glasses for everything. They always ask, well, can you, can you swap this lens out? It is probably one of the hardest lenses to do an exchange on because the haptics are so large that it is almost impossible to remove those haptics without removing some of the capsule with it. So 
lens exchange for crystal lens patients is incredibly difficult and in a lot of the um, clinical trials such as the you know the telescopic lenses for your MACDGEN patients a lot of the clinical trials exclude patients that have crystal lens because it is just really difficult to remove these versus these other lenses a little bit easier to remove and do an exchange on so panoptics came out and that kind of at least for the past two three years is really there's been so many changes now in the implant space um, panoptics is still in the US at least the only lens that is approved for the three zones of focus so you're getting your near, you're getting your intermediate, your far, and you can see our panoptics video for that that I put up when it first came out, I think three years now. Um, so now the first time we can get all three distances and kind of a game changer because if you look back before this, we were doing all kinds of little, <laughs> little tricks to get people to see all zones of focus. So the next few pictures I'm gonna show you are helpful because as you talk to patients about these lenses, this IV, oh, Francis is, oh, there we go. So as you talk to patients about lenses and implant technology, it's good to give real life situations because what does near mean? What does intermediate mean? It's a little technical change. So here we go. So um, I'm gonna show you some photos of real life examples because when you talk to patients about these different technology lenses you you should give real life examples because how do you how do you explain to someone what does near mean well I just kind of show bent arm but real life examples are probably more helpful how does this mean to them in when they're shopping at the grocery store for instance oh oh one more thing this is a good reminder since Panoptics, there's all these other lenses that we're not to go, gonna go into too much detail about. You have Synergy, Vividity, Light Adjusted, iHands, so many different details about this. We could spend hours talking about all these. But we're gonna do more practical here. That's the point of these lectures, practical. So let's give a real life example. How do you talk to patients about these lenses? This is a practical example. So if someone's sitting at a table they want to look at their phone, they want to look at their computer, and they also want to see down the hall on the clock on the wall. So this is a really nice picture to kind of explain these three main zones of focus, right? Because you've got your, your reading, your computer, and your phone. So you, you can describe it to the patient. Imagine you're sitting at your home in your desk. What are the objects around you? What are the distances? You're, you got, you've got your computer, you've got your, your, your watch, you've got you know, your clock on the wall. Here's another real life picture. This is when you're driving. So you've got your dashboard and you've got the cars across the way there. But then sometimes you might want to look even closer. Let's say you have a coffee cup or you want to check your watch. You shouldn't check your phone when you're driving. So that's why that's not on here. <laughs> <laughs> but you can you want to see these three distances oh one more thing people forget this which is the mirror so some of the newer cars are coming out instead of a mirror it's a it's a digital display and for the patients that have presbyopia they're having a hard time seeing that digital display because it's an intermediate focus versus if it was a regular mirror. So I think that's interesting. On the presbyopic patient with bifocal, they can't really see the mirror very well unless they tilt their head up all the way up to the bottom of their glasses. So give real life examples. One example I give to patients learning these distances is, you know, you're at the grocery store and you can see the bread aisle, you walk to the bread aisle, you can see the bread on the shelf, you pick it up, can you read the label? So you've got three different zones of focus. Like here, you've got your coffee, you've got your dashboard, and you have the cars across the street. So give real life examples when you're talking about distances and you're learning about the different types of lenses because each lens has its strengths. Each lens has its weaknesses. Another good example, your, your watch, your, your dash, and your cars. So this is an interesting one. This is nighttime. 
So I put this on here because when it's nighttime vision, some of the lenses that are multifocal aren't going to perform as well. So you also want to keep that in mind when you're talking to people. Hey, you can see your, well, maybe not so good at nighttime. If you're a truck driver that does a lot of night trips, um, this might not be a good situation for you. So if you go back to, remember those old uh, pictures of the symphony and crystal lens? We had to do a lot of little, um, we had to spend a little more time with patients back then because we had to talk to them about, okay, you gotta use your reading glasses, or we can make one eye near, we can one, one eye far, we can do a mini mono, there was all these little nuances to the counseling before surgery. And it, it actually was kind of hard because we could never get all three zones of focus with the older lenses without doing like a mix and match or blended. So it's a little easier now with, with like the trifocal lenses. But a lot of those old discussions and those history of how do we talk to people about mini mono a lot of that discussion is still present to this day when we're looking at, you know, like a, like a Vividity lens, for instance. So we went over some of these graphs on the last cataract lecture. I found one, and you can see it does drop off with pen optics in that zone of focus here. So in some of our pen optics patients, we have to warn them about that. If you're a card dealer at the casino, um, if there's someone on a smaller table, you, you won't see them as clearly as you would up close in the near zone of focus versus your far focus. So there's a little drop off zone like we talked about on the last lecture. So also keep this in mind too, there are people with all the lenses, and this is the example of pen optics, um, there's side effects with the multifocal lenses. In order to get those zones of focus into focus, we are going to have more side effects. We have starbursts, halos. We always warn a lot of people about halo effects, but that's for many people with these multifocal lenses, especially at night. So overall, it's most people like it, but there's still that 1% just don't do well on that lens. So, um, I, I think about, at least in our, in our practice, the patient satisfaction. So as you're measuring your vision, you're, you're working them up, you're getting their autorefraction, and then you're, you're checking their pressure. More important than the 2020, and by all means, if you get 2020, celebrate. If you get 2015, push them. You know, always if you get 2020, see if they can do 2015. See if they can do a little bit more. But more important than the actual vision and the number is, is this. This is the satisfaction. <laughs> so you can tell on Tuesday morning when they come in and they check in if you're a liaison, are they smiling? That's already, you know, that's good. That's a good sign. And then two, um, patients love to tell their story. How was it when they woke up this morning? They love to tell you. Oh, I looked in the mirror and I... I didn't realize I, I had gray hair. I didn't realize I had wrinkles. Or they love to say, I was last night I was looking up and I see cobwebs on my, on my corners of my walls. I didn't realize how dirty my floor was in the bathroom. And they love to tell their story. I think that is a really good measure of their satisfaction. Let them tell and share their story. I love that part of it. Tuesday is kind of fun because you hear, <laughs> you hear all these stories like, oh my goodness, I didn't know there was trees on on that hill up there and I drove 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 here today so it's kind of nice to hear those stories and then sometimes they're just so thrilled they want to give you a hug and so there's to me this is more rewarding than the actual vision it is to hear the patient's reaction in their journey so your battery's low there Kate I think we'll have to plug that in again all right so patient satisfaction so what I'd like to do next is take a little break from some of the practical. We're going to actually show some case examples so you can see this here. So this actually is one of our patients. That's not her picture. I didn't actually put her picture on here. <laughs> but <clears throat> So we have a patient who came in <clears throat> and she said, I can't see. 
and we measured her vision and it was count finger only one eye I mean she really had a lot of problems and what's interesting is you look at what she's wearing she was like a minus three but her AR says a minus ten and I, I I see this show up quite a bit where someone's really at surgical stage of cataract and the AR is going to pick up huge myopic shift on it so as you're working a patient up that's some a pattern you'll see quite a bit so for text do you see that yet? Have you seen it? Yes, you've seen it? Yeah. No? Mm. So when you do this and you're working the patient up, you put in their glasses, they're only count finger, you try to refract, even if you put a minus 10, they're still count finger, well, there you go. It's, it's not a glasses issue. You see huge myopic shifts like this. And so we did cataract, we did it with laser, and there's the laser one more time in case you forget. The laser does all these cuts. It breaks up the cataract. Each little zap, and this happens so quickly. I mean, we're talking seconds. Faster than that video, that's how quick the laser is. <laughs> so um, this is what she looked like on the first day, really clean cornea, and she already was 20-20, uh, I think, on that first day. So beautiful day one. That's what we like. And this is one of the benefits of femto laser. So for the really thick cataracts, even though we have a really good method by hand, sometimes we do like to use a laser on the massive mature cataracts because the laser broke up the cataract, there's theoretically less damage to the corneal endothelium. So they're less likely to have as much corneal edema on the first day. So when you talk about some of the benefits of the femto laser, I think that's a really good one. Now, if, if you have a medium or a regular type cataract, it, it's not going to be any consequence. But if you have a massive cataract like this, I think there is a small benefit to the femto laser. You're going to break it up with the laser, and that means our ultrasound doesn't have to do as much work to remove those pieces. So, uh, when you talk to people, who are the best candidates for multifocal lenses? Um, usually it's someone who you're probably going to do both eyes, because it's hard to do just one and then they have to wear glasses afterwards for the unoperated eye, especially if they're gonna do both eyes, because then you'd have the benefit of both eyes getting those zones of focus and the best depth reception. Two, I'm gonna make sure if you're gonna choose a multifocal lens, the ones that have a history of refractive surgery usually don't do as well. I found when we do a multifocal in our post-LASIK patients, have higher side effects, um, interestingly. And we do it, I mean, for the really motivated patient, we will definitely offer some of these advanced lenses, but they have to keep in mind the LASIK can increase some of those negative side effects. Number three, they want to make sure they don't have any other serious pathology like retina disease, like if they have an epirectinal membrane, or if they have moderate severe glaucoma because if there's any other optic nerve or retina issue or severe dry eye, any cornea pathology like keratoconus, they're going to fail on the multifocal lens. <laughs> and um, that's the last thing you want to do because now you have someone who has a lens that isn't working. Um, yeah, patient satisfaction. So. And this is why we spend so much time before surgery. You want to really make sure that the patient and their spouse or whoever's with them in the room completely understand every part of the surgery. They have to know all the steps of the surgery. They have to know the risk and benefit of whether we do standard traditional ultrasound, of whether we do the laser. They have to understand the nuance of the lens implant that we finalize their selection on. So having that time beforehand, letting them know these are the chance of, chances of failure, these are the chances of success, really helps them guide them through this journey. So if they're that one percent that has a problem, well now they kind of already knew that was a possibility. There's no surprises. 
No surprises mean, well, I'm that 1%. Now let's look at our options. Do we go back and do a lens exchange, for instance? Or let's say it's a toric lens and it rotated post-op. Well, does that mean we go back and rotate it back? So if you counsel them about some of these possibilities, if it happens, it's no great surprise. They say, well, I knew that was a possibility. You kind of warned me about some of these nighttime halos, for instance. So four, uh, four ways, I think, especially for Kate, as you're going through pre-ops, you want to, number one, use plain language. Make it easy to understand. That's why I gave some of those real life examples. Like when you're driving, you've got your dashboard, your coffee cup, your, your road sign. Give real life examples. You're at the dinner table with your spouse. You can see your food, your, you know, your TV. You know, give real life examples of how their vision is expected to be after surgery, depending on the lens. Or you're choosing monofocal, you're choosing monovision. How is that going to look like in the real world to you? Uh, use visual tools. Um, if you have a patient maybe having a harder time understanding cataract, you can pull out our model of the eye and show them on there. I mean, we have a few in the back. You can pull that out. Okay, this is your cataract. We're going to take it out, put an artificial lens, and show them the tools for that. Show them photos of it. Direct them to the website. Direct them to the YouTube. I mean, there's a lot of tools we can direct them to. Three, limit information and repeat it. So studies show that when patients leave a doctor office, and it doesn't matter whether it's ophthalmology or primary care, but studies show that 90% of what we tell the patient, they're going to forget 10 minutes later. So they're only going to really retain 10% of what we're telling them. So the critical portions of it, repeat. Make sure they understand. Make sure they vocalize it and repeat it back to you. So these important parts like, okay, just to be sure, uh, Mr. Smith, you've decided on monovision, so you understand what that means, right? One eye is going to be near, one's far. If you close your right eye, you're not going to be able to see across the room. You understand that, right? Okay, good. So now we can move on. So just make sure you you have them really understand it. You don't want to go to all the details of, oh, well, your cylinder is this, your angle kappa is this. It's all going to go over their head, and you can really overwhelm someone as they're already stressed out enough as it is talking about cataract, and then you're going to all these details, it can be very overwhelming. So give practical examples, be very straightforward, and one thing that I like to do is when we know they already are not a candidate for certain technologies, we don't even talk about it. We only talk about the technology they qualify for, and that really makes it more streamlined. We can say, hey, because of your eye disease, you have macular degeneration, these are your two options. You can do A or B. And having two choices is a lot better than, well, we have the eye hence lens, the light adjusted, we've got panoptics, we've got aura. It's too much. We try to streamline it for them so they don't have to know what an LRI is and a CRI, and it's just too much, too much to process. So I like to summarize it. These are these these are your options, the three pathways or the two pathways you can go for surgery. And then finally, four um, open-ended questions are really helpful. This goes both for pre for the pre-op and the consultation. How how do those symptoms affect your day to day? So that's a great question you can ask them. Okay, so you're having trouble. We get your vision at 2050. How does this really affect you? At what points of the day do you see most of these effects? So what are you doing at those times? Because they'll sometimes tell you, as they answer that question, that they're a golfer and they can't see their golf ball. Or they'll tell you, I crochet, I can't thread my needle anymore. They'll tell you a little bit about their hobbies with an open-ended question. So great questions to ask patients is open-ended. And I try all the time to do that. Whether it's a pre-op or, you know, or, you know, when you're working the patient up. And this maybe not even cataract, this it pertains to any, any eye problem. Open-ended always is better because you really get to, to, to hear them. <coughs> um, expectation management, I think, is really important to talk about because 
we, I mean, how, how many of you have seen those patients who want it all and they're upset and they say, well, I'm 2020, but I have to wear reading glasses. I don't like this. Make me better. And you're like, well, you're, you're 2020. That's great. I mean, a lot of people love to be 2020, but they want more. They want to be able to, to see like a 20 year old sniper in the Marines and there are some things that we want, but there's a reality to it. Um, just like our patient who's 70 is not going to be able to run a marathon after their knee transplant, our 70-year-old after eye surgery probably won't be fighting an F-16 fighter. It just physically, we can't do it all. So um, there's, a tr there's kind of a graph here that I keep in mind. Um, success is what we always want and through the years what we really try to do is if this is our reality curve when we talk to patients we want to make sure that our expectation curve is slightly below reality <laughs> so that way reality is here if expectation expectations here we're more likely to get that wow factor so if we warn the patient, oh, you're choosing a multifocal lens, you're probably going to have nighttime glare because some people do, and you're probably going to get it. And let's say after surgery, they don't have the nighttime glare, they're going to have a wow factor. Their expectation is I will probably have these nighttime side effects, and if they don't get it, even better. So always be realistic and make sure our expectations are correct here. So going back to this, Stephen Hawking, my expectations were reduced to zero when I was 21, and everything since then has been a bonus. So if your expectation is here, you could be happy about everything in life. <laughs> everything. Whether you get sick, well, at least I'm not something else. Or we have financial issues, well, at least this didn't happen. So um, the reality is there's a lot to be thankful for. There's always a silver lining. and um, in our own personal lives and as we talk to patients we try to be optimistic and 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 see the positive in, in everything so here's another case example to kind of break it up a little bit this is our really active 50 year old and he does not want to wear contacts glasses he's like look I I had PRK and it was great, but over the past few years, I now have to use glasses, not just to read, but I've got to use glasses to see my tennis ball and I hate it. I don't like wiping my sweat off my brow and then my glasses are fogging and I'm trying to ride my bike and I can't. You got a real active 50 year old and there's his refraction. He's a plus one. So he's now our hyperopic patient who used to be um, without any glasses. So, someone who's ho so motivated to be out of glasses, we do our topography actually look really good. There's not any dry eye, uh, cornea is clear, PRK's treatment looks great, and we did lens exchange. So, he's very happy, 2020. So, I think there are some times when you will see someone who has very high expectations. We reeled him in a little bit. We said, hey, look, your vision after a multifocal lens may not be as clear as you have with glasses for reading or for night vision. And if you're okay with that, this is maybe something we can do. And now he's out of glasses, so he's very happy. So um, you, we will often ask these patients and now that you know some of the lenses have been on the market for a little longer we have thousands of patients in our history we can we can think of who may have had side effects and the next time we run across a patient who does similar hobbies we can warn them about them a little bit better um, talking about technology I just want to put this in here because this is something I'm really looking forward to at some point and we have the lens technology, but surgery technology, this is something in the future. So 
what this is, is instead of having a normal microscope, we have a digital camera. Instead of looking directly at the eye, we're having a digital processor look at the eye and show us an image on a 3D monitor or 3D TV. So now every nurse in the room can see what we get to see in 3D. So right now, look at all this. We've got cables, we've got the microscope, and you can see what I see if you're a nurse in the room, right there, but it's not in 3D. You don't get to see the whole thing. So the new technology is gonna display it on a screen here, and there's a little camera, and then there's a processor, and these three pieces give us 3D imaging. So now I'm not going to be hunched over a microscope. I'm going to sit back and operate with better ergonomics. And everyone in the room can see the 3D. And then when we record these, we can show it and showcase it to people in 3D. And you'll get more of the nuance of surgery. Interesting, especially now as AI systems are coming into place. You can take an image and process the image to give you more contrast or process the image to have overlays of maybe how big to make your capsule rexus or where the steepest point of astigmatism is so there's so much that is going to happen when this really when this technology becomes more available here so um, look at this we can keep the lights really low during surgery so the patient doesn't have to stare at a super bright light they can we can turn the light down but then have the digital processor increase our exposure after the fact look at that we can take an image I just have to put these 3d goggles on and now we can see it so benefits you can get maybe some image processing maybe, maybe better visualization ergonomically I'm gonna be a little bit happier and collaboration that means I can showcase a video to another surgeon and they will really be able to experience it as I did because it's 3D. So depth of field, um, I think Kate would understand this, you're a photographer. When you're focused on someone's eye doing a portrait, sometimes the back of their ear is out of focus and you don't get the whole screen in high def. Well, if you're using a digital processor instead of a microscope, you can get the whole eye in focus. And I see this when we do surgery. I will be focused on the cornea, but the cataract is out of focus. Or then I zoom in to the capsule, and now the cornea is out of focus. So with a digital processor, we can get everything in focus. And that gives us an entire view of the eye. So just some other examples. You can zoom in even greater detail with the digital processor. Edge to edge focus. So that's something excited I'm looking forward to. Okay, going back to some cases. So, do you want to read this one? Case number three, 64 year old with glare and decreased vision is wearing on the right eye, it's at plus 50, minus 125. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So sometimes we get a patient that comes in for a cataract consultation and it is not always a cataract. That's why I put this on here because we'll get a referral from a primary care or an optometrist and they say, hey guys, I need cataracts. I can't see. And in this patient, he was having a really hard, he's like, look, I'm trying to play pickleball and I cannot see my ball. Can you please help me fix my cataract? And look it, he's got prism. Interesting, he's got glare, he's got only 2070 vision. And I look and I'm like, yeah, you've got cataract, but how come you have prism? That's really, that's really unusual. Have you had prism your whole life or is this something new? He's like, no, it just, I just started getting prism when I got my new glasses with the optometrist and there was prism in it. Well, looking a little deeper on his examination, 
we did extra ocular motility. So remember back to our lecture about documentation in ophthalmology? Motility is part of that. It's part of the vital signs. And when we looked at his eyes, he could not move his eye to the lateral gaze. Well, that's not good. And he also had trouble with up gaze. Well, that's not good either. So, here's our exam. We've got esotropia, we've got a palsy, and a cataract. So this is the case where we don't just say, let's jump straight to cataract, because I love cataract surgery. We have to look at the whole picture. And you have to look at the whole patient. And a lot of times, when we're in healthcare, you're going to have your job to do. But you don't just want to do your job. You want to look at the bigger picture. And always, always don't have your blinders on. Have your whole, look at the whole room. You know, if you're, if you're in a weight room and you have your own patient, but you see another patient maybe having some issues, you have, to, you have to see that too. If you have a teammate at work that's having some problems with the patient, maybe you can give them a helping hand. You, you have to keep your whole world, everything around you open. You can't ever in life be trapped in that box. So in this case, he came for cataract. He was here for cataract. He wanted surgery, but there was another problem. So what do we do? Well, we do imaging. So um, we did imaging, and this is kind of going through the images. And look at that. Look at that. There's another one. There's another one right here. There's another one right there in the basal, in the brainstem. There's another one right here. There's another one right there. There's another one right there, and another one up there. So the head imaging revealed multiple metastases inside the brain. So here's someone who's an active guy who just thought he had cataract, and now we have to break the bad news and tell him, hey, look, your, your head imaging came back, and yes, we, we want to help you with your cataract, but we need to get you with an oncologist. And so sometimes as we go through our cataract patients, sometimes we'll run across these just devastating stories. Um, but always keep your ears out, always keep your eyes out for ways that we can help emotionally um, and help them also from a perspective of getting them to the right doctor. So he really did not need a cataract surgeon at this point. He needed an oncologist, and we got him help for that. So um, here's kind of the top view. You can see some more of these again. Look for those little metastases. There's a couple there, frontal lobe, occipital lobe. There's one there, temporal lobe. And then brainstem, there's one there. So. very sad story, but because we found it, he had time to get his life together, to set up his wills, to get his, his whole family, and kind of make all the arrangements. And uh, he did really well. Once they put him on chemotherapy, he did really well and was able to, able to handle this because we caught it early. We caught it early before he had a seizure and a brain hemorrhage and died, you know. He, we caught it in time for him to to have a little bit more time with treatment. So, next case. Uh, I think this might be the last one. We have a 76 year old, glare decreased vision, and she has horrible, I mean, horrible glare. And we look at the vision, yes, there's a cataract, 20, 40, 2200. So when you, when you see a patient, they have 2200 vision and the cataract is only level two, you have to wonder what else is there. This is why we always dilate everyone, always, and this is what we see. So, right eye, maybe a little borderline optic nerve cupping, left eye, same thing, but there is a large choroidal tumor in the left eye, and we actually had another patient just like this recently too. So now we've seen two like this in a short period of time. So you can do the OCT, there's 
fluid at the edge of that choroidal mass, so this is a warning sign for choroidal melanoma. So in this case too, we of course want to help our cataract patient, but you've got to keep the blinders off. You've got to look at everything, and this patient needed the melanoma taken care of. So that finishes the presentation and all of this about cataract technology. Try to put a couple cases in there to kind of give you some examples. Um, I guess if there's other topics you want to talk about, just put it in our queue. We'll just add it to more. And I'll, if you like this format a little better with pictures, I think we'll do that again. And, or if you like the chalkboard method, <laughs> different ways to do it. Questions on any of this? When you have a patient with cataract and prism, what type of lens are you going oh, yeah. like? Would you stay with basic? Just yeah. So they have to wear glasses anyway? Absolutely. So, great question. And that is if someone's in prism, what do we do with the lenses on cataract patients? Well, there is currently no prism lens implant. Interesting. What if we do get that? I think. That would be fascinating because now we'd have a toric prism lens. There's no prism lens. And so if you have a prism patient, they are guaranteed to need the prism in spectacles after surgery. In which case, we're going to choose either a monofocal or like an toric type lens to just give their vision a little bit better improvement. Uh, but regardless, they're still going to need prism afterwards because we we can't do a prism implant. So on those patients, we stay far away from any multifocal lens. It, it causes problems. And a lot of the patients with prism also have had amblyopia. And if you remember, that's a contraindication relatively for a multifocal lens. So, oh, yeah, you have prism. And if I see a patient that had prism, I'll tell them that on the consult. Hey, you're, you're going to read about cataract implants. I know you're going to see some videos online the multifocal lens doesn't apply to you, so skip those videos unless you're curious, because those videos about multifocal, it's not gonna work for you. Did Ivy or Francis have questions? I need that. Did I have questions? Oh yeah, um, yeah, so let's talk about that. It's really rare to happen, um, but the toric lens can spin in the capsule after surgery. So let's go back to that. Uh, how do I go back? So if we go back to how this lens is implanted, so we use Aura to, to rotate the lens right to that spot. So if that's the axis, we're going to rotate the lens right to that axis, right? But sometimes the patient can go home and the lens won't stay plate in place. It will spin. And all it takes is 15 degrees of rotation and we're going to lose all the effectiveness of the toric power. So they'll come after surgery and they're fine and then, or they might come the very next day and not be fine. And then you look and the lens is in a different spot than where you put it. So we may have put it at say zero degrees and now they're at 15 degrees. Well, that's a problem because we're not getting the, the whole power of the lens. It's like having your glasses and wearing them crooked. <laughs> it's off target. So with the repositioning, you go back to surgery, you inflate the capsule with viscoelastic again, and then you rotate it to where the lens is supposed to be. You have two options at that point. You have to either A, make sure no more viscoelastic is in the, in the bag, both in front of and behind, and you really want to seed the lens onto the capsule so it sticks there and doesn't rotate 
or B, you can also take that lens optic and do reverse optic capture because sometimes that makes it a bit more stable. And you, you have to really make sure that the patient doesn't do any heavy lifting. You have to make sure there's no pressure spikes or issues afterwards because you would hate to have to reposition more than once. Actually, you hate to reposition even once. I mean, this, <laughs> it's kind of a, it kind of slows down the patient's recovery. They have to, they have to spend, you know, two, three more weeks on the eye drops that they would have not had to do if the lens didn't rotate. So hopefully that helps that question. Uh, any other questions? No? Okay. All right. Well, then we'll just finish off with that and um, try to keep some practical examples that maybe come up with their own when you talk to patients about the lenses because um, it's kind of nice to give real world examples. I think for me, that's probably the biggest take home when I think about these cases. Number one, be, be practical and give real examples. And two, expectations, make sure they're realistic. And three, don't get so focused, don't get in your track, kind of keep things open about, about uh, open-ended questions and also open-ended about, hey, I, it, this may not be the right thing for you. We've, we've, this past week alone, we've talked several people out of cataract surgery because they just were not a candidate for it. <laughs> and they were shocked when I told them that, um, but this is, this is how it is, there's a time and place for surgery. <laughs> Okay, we'll just end there. Okay.